All right, welcome back to another episode of Content Is For Closers. Carlton, we're no longer in person. We're back to the remote intro recording, uh, but we did have a really fun episode. Also, uh, thankfully remote recorded because our guest today is from the UK, uh, Jamie Whiffen, producer for Ali Abdal. What did you think of the conversation? I was great, man. Uh, we're going a little bit different direction this episode um, by kind of leaning into the YouTube and video aspect side of things instead of just the podcast side of things. So um, it's all content, right? And I think Jamie offers some incredible insights on what it means to produce content, not just for YouTube, but at a certain level. Hmm. And uh, when we talk about a certain level, he is the producer for uh, Ali Abdul. So if you don't know who that is, uh, he's an incredible YouTuber, um, massive following, just slightly larger than ours, um, just, <laughs> just by a few uh, decimal places. Uh, so yeah, great episode, tons of great takeaways, but what was your impression, Adam? Yeah, I think just, um, first of all, it was interesting to hear someone who is in as deep as Jamie is into, like you said, YouTube versus some of the other things that we've talked about on the show. Um, and just the level of, you know, people talk about 10,000 hours, people talk about uh, a certain amount of reps or whatever it, to be able to come great at something. And Jamie's been doing YouTube since he was, you know, a middle schooler or, or, or a teenager. Yeah, yeah. And so it just the, the the craftsmanship that he exudes when it comes to knowing the little wrinkles of the platform, knowing how to make um, really great videos about pretty much any topic. Like he goes through and talks about making gaming videos, making productivity videos. Um, now he's doing some for like creator economy stuff in addition to what he does for Ollie. I thought that was really great. And then the second thing was just his commitment to his side, you know, his his own um, creativity. Like he is a creative for his job, but he talked a lot about the uh, the energy and the investment that he puts into his own projects. And I I thought that was really encouraging for yeah. like, I tend to get really locked in on like one thing and this is like the thing I do. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, so that was encouraging me to like expand past that. But how, how did you interact with that as someone who does? Yeah, a lot well, that, that was a great, um, he, cause he talked about like ways of discovering content and ways of kind of figuring out what you can do for a side project or how you, how you make that blend work. Um, and so he talked a lot about just moving fast and breaking things. And I know that's kind of like the mantra of uh, entrepreneurship and in some ways kind of like the tech world. I think Facebook kind of uh, made that popular with that with that idea. Um, but it really is true in content, too, because um, we don't really know what will work. And I think, you know, I remember putting stuff on YouTube and kind of like getting to a point where I stopped because it was like, eh, this just doesn't seem like it's going to take off. And that was, you know, many, many years ago. Um, kind of as it was coming out, but it, it, it was that for him, he kept going and kept trying and kept doing different things. And that allowed him to not only see what worked, um, but to get practice doing it. So mm -hmm. totally agree with what you're saying. Um, there's so many different parts from a creator, uh, especially for those of you who are in the creator economy or are looking to get into the creator economy, that will be super valuable for this, for this episode. All right. Well, real quick, before we dive in, uh, we missed this last week because we were in person. I forgot to to do this. Uh, but we do have yet another five star review to read. This one comes from V Rose. The subject is content marketing with diverse. And then I don't know how to expand this. So the title was longer than than I could see. But <laughs> something about diverse or diversity yes. potentially. Uh, and it says Five stars. Enjoyed this podcast. This podcast is great for marketing leadership and business entrepreneurs. It offers diverse perspectives. Maybe that's what the title was on various content related to on various related. Oh my goodness. On various content related to content topics. Your boy is struggling today. Uh, so thank you to V Rose for that five star review. As always, we read them as you write them. So you can write whatever you want in there and we will uh, within reason read it on the show. 
Uh, but yeah, without further ado, unless you have something else, Carlson, let's get into it with That's Jamie Whiffen. On this episode, we're joined by Jamie Whiffen, who is the producer for Ali Abdal's YouTube channel, in addition to creating his own very successful channels. And this was a unique episode, as we don't often get to talk to YouTube experts like Jamie. So we took full advantage of the opportunity and asked him about creating on the platform for the past decade, what he is excited about in terms of new features, and how he balances his own creative endeavors with the work he does with with Ollie's team. I'm so grateful to Jamie for taking the time to talk with us and I feel very lucky to have gotten to meet him. If you're if you're into YouTube, the creator economy or just want a behind the scenes look at how a major chan channel like Ollie's gets made, this episode is for you. Let's dive in with Jamie Whiffen. All right, we are back. We've got Jamie Whiffen here on the podcast. Jamie, thank you so much for making time with us all the way from across the pond. We appreciate you being here. Yeah, thanks for having me on. Uh, I've been listening to the podcast uh, for the past few weeks now and uh, really enjoy it. So, so it's nice to, to come on here and be a guest. Yeah, awesome. We're so excited to have you. So uh, for, for those of you who don't know, obviously we talked about it in the intro, but Jamie is the producer for Ali Abdal's uh, YouTube channel. But Jamie, I know you've had like a very uh, robust career prior to this. You've launched a bunch of YouTube channels. You, you've done work for a bunch of different brands. Um, can you just give us, walk us through what, what the last uh, part of your career prior to now has looked like? Uh, yeah. I mean, it's it, like you say, it's, it's a bit all over the place. I've kind of just done a little bit of everything in online, mostly YouTube related, but I've done other things on like Instagram and such. But yeah, I mean, I started making YouTube videos when I was around 12 years old. So I'm 26 now. So, you know, getting up to like around 15 years I've been on YouTube. <laughs> Crazy. So I've been obsessed with it for quite a long time. And obviously at, at that time I started to just, you know, make silly YouTube videos as a kid. Like I, you know, record myself pretending I had a lightsaber and, you know, edit that in. That was kind awesome. of like what I was doing back in the day. And uh, over time, I just started to get more familiar with, with cameras and, and things like that. And a couple of my friends started a gaming YouTube channel that they did together. This is around the time Minecraft started to get a lot bigger. And I thought it looked fun. And so I started to produce my own gaming YouTube videos. And yeah, I just, I just made videos maybe like once or twice a week. And I did that for a number of years and grew that channel to around, I think like 95,000 subscribers at its peak. Wow. Um, and joined like a Machinima, which is a big network back in, back in the day. Um, and yeah, f f when I was like a, a, you know, a young teenager, I kind of like learned how to create thumbnails, you know, using Photoshop, how to, you know, edit your videos, how to present, how to speak on camera, all of these different things. And a lot of skills came from that. And it then led me to kind of like go to university. And that's kind of like why I stopped making YouTube videos for a little bit. And that YouTube channel like kind of slowed down. Um, but once I graduated university, I joined uh, a marketing agency called Little Dot Studios. What they primarily did was essentially license old TV shows and then repurpose that for, uh, their YouTube channels, their hub mm. channels, what they would call that. So they would have uh, a channel called nurture, for example, which was all around, um, uh, like ch children and babies. And so I was in charge of that YouTube channel and I would take clips like super nanny and like all of these TV shows. And I would cut up all of these clips and put it onto their YouTube channel. And over time I started to, you know, progress within the company and I was managing Gordon Ramsay's YouTube channel and MTV and kind of like just kind of working in that space, mostly kind of like repurposing TV for YouTube. Uh, and I was there for a number of years. I moved on and worked for uh, like a forward thinking accounting agency um, and kind of like worked on their marketing there and kind of like helped bring them up. Because obviously when you think about uh, accountancy, you think of people in like gray suits. Yeah. They were very much <laughs> not like that. It was, it was about like making it look like a fun place to work and, and kind of like attracting clients in that way. Now I worked there for a number of years, moved on to another agency called Fanbytes. This is predominantly a TikTok agency. Okay. And so... Uh, yeah, I worked there for about eight or nine months, um, working with a variety of different uh, TikTok stars and eventually had this job come up to work for Ali. And that's where I moved over to where I currently am. Um, and in between all of that, I've done all of these little side projects on the side, like an Instagram page that I run and, you know, all of this kind of stuff and, and a new YouTube channel that I have. And so, yeah, I'm, I'm a little bit everywhere, done a bit of everything, kind of uh, been a bit busy. And so... Yeah, it's 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 uh it's very hard to like put into words when someone says, So what do you do? Or like what's what's your career look like? Yeah. I love that though. It's such a it's such a great picture of the modern uh career, especially the modern career on the internet. Like you can look at like a bunch of different things, you look like creating your own ideas, creating the ideas for others, and a huge mix uh in between. I have to ask a couple follow up questions there. One 
the lightsaber footage. Is that something that is uh, <laughs> publicly available? Is that is that something you're going to feature on a on a YouTube sometime? You know what? I I, I can't tell you off the top of my head. I think it may be unlisted. Okay. But if it's not, I will unlist it after this video. So if anyone goes and searches for it on my old gaming YouTube channel, they'll find it. Okay. Probably like a 12 year old video at this point. Um, but yeah, that was me getting started with it. It's probably, it's got like a 40 second introduction of all these graphics on screen before it even gets to the clip. Yep. That shows how little I knew about making a good YouTube video back then. That's all right. It's, it's, it's I love that type of stuff. Uh, I have my own versions of those. I, I think I was too old though to unlist them because I was um I was already in college when we were doing things like that, so uh, might might have to stay hidden. <laughs> <clears throat> but um, obviously you you mentioned you've done a, a large swath of different things. You've worked for a bunch of different companies. Now you're producing uh, Ollie's channel, and are you producing both the main channel as well as the um the vlog content, or is that different? Yeah, so I'm I'm the Ali's YouTube producer, and that basically means I'm, I'm like overseeing every single one of the YouTube channels. So that's okay. the main channel, the second channel, which is now a daily vlogs channel. Mm -hmm. um, that's kind of since the beginning of May, we've been doing that. Um, and also the deep dive podcast. We do have a, a podcast producer who works on the podcast. So they're kind of like in charge of that, but we have like weekly calls out to all of their questions, kind of like oversee everything there to make sure the podcast is, is going ahead. But with the second vlog channel, it's very much a collaborative effort between myself and Gordon, which is the uh, videographer for Ali. Okay. So he's the, obviously the one who shoots all of that, that content. Um, and yeah, it's kind of like a, a process between us to, to get that out on a, on a daily basis. Yeah. So I, I kind of wanted to fold into that a little bit. I've never worked on something that comes out every day like that, especially mm -hmm. not something that's your own, you know? Um, so, you know, how did you have to, what did that adaption process look like? I'm sure you've worked on a lot, um, a lot more refined things for brands and, and things like that. Uh, and then you've obviously done, like you were talking about gaming videos and all that sort of thing. So it's not completely novel, but how has that changed how you've thought about the creative process when you have to publish every single day or every weekday or whatever it is? Yeah. So well, when this idea was initially floated around, some of us were a bit nervous, like, well, that's you know, a big task yeah. to, to get, you know, a really good video out every single day. Can we do that? Um, we kind of went into it with the mindset that we're not going to try and make this the the best podcast i'm sorry the best uh, daily vlog on youtube we're just going to record our day and put it out there and we'll start to tweak it as we go mm -hmm. and we'll essentially start to refine that content rather than brainstorming for weeks on end like how can we make this you know doable and then you know let, let's just get started and, and start to work it out and so uh what that looked like was gordon kind of like ensured that he had all of the equipment so he could like run and gun and get around the office to, to film ali um, and kind of like free up some more of his time so that he'd be able to go to meetings that Ali was in or if Ali was, you know, away from the office, he'd be able to follow him and record all of that. He put in place a video editor so that they would receive the footage and edit it for that next day. So we, we ideally tried to get the footage by 3 p.m. for a uh, 5 p.m. go live date. Doesn't always happen. Depends on like how much footage has been shot the day before, yeah. but that's kind of what we aim for. Um, and like a way that we very quickly learned how to do that would be to, it's something I, I, I've seen like Logan Paul do a number of years ago when he was doing his daily vlog, he had his video editor in the UK. That was so that once he finished in LA time, he could just send that footage, upload it overnight and he would instantly get to the UK mm. guy. He would video edit it. And by the time Logan would wake up, he'd have a video edit that he could review and, and send for further tweaks. And so that's something that we now do. We, we have a video editor that's not in the UK. Um, so that that time difference allows us to upload that footage, at, you know, put whatever time we finish. Sometimes the vlog will get finished at 10, 11 p.m. Uh, sometimes it finishes at 5 p.m. It really depends on what's going on in that day. But we'll try our best to get it to that editor and they can give it to us by uh, the next morning. Yeah, that time arbitrage, something people don't people think of arbitrage in terms of cost, like, oh, you can offshore mm -hmm. for whatever. But the time arbitrage is probably more valuable in a lot of ways because, we, you know, you can, like you said, yeah. have it while while you're sleeping. What about just zooming out? Um, you you on all those agency experiences, I imagine you had multiple clients or, or more than one. Uh, in this case, you, you sort of do and that you're doing a bunch of different executions, but it's all around one person, one personality mm -hmm. being Ali and, and all his, all of his content. Um, how, how has that adjustment been going from, uh, you know, a bunch of things I'd imagine in some way it simplifies things, but I'm sure there's also just differences, uh, from, from a traditional agency environment. 
Um, yes, it's different in, in, in the fact that now you're working directly with that influencer. You have that direct relationship with them. And that is very beneficial in the sense that you can help to like guide them. You can help to shape what we should be doing, what we should try to stop doing to help grow the YouTube channel. When you're working with an influence inside of an agency, you don't really have much control. You're kind of your remote, right? So you can only send them an email or a WhatsApp. You, you have the occasional Zoom call. It's a little bit more difficult to kind of help guide them um, because it, it's also interesting in that something I've noticed is that influencers that work with agencies tend to, I don't know what it is with, with influencers and agencies. Some, some agencies, depending on how they work, it, there's like a, like a, a bit of friction, I think mm -hmm. in that, like sometimes they don't want to listen to someone else to tell them how to be creative or how to do things. They want right. to say, I got myself here before you guys even came to me, to be part of the agency or to work with you guys. I know what I'm doing. I know what my audience is. And a part of that is absolutely true, but there are some influencers out there who have a bit of an ego. I know what I'm doing and they don't listen to agencies and sometimes it would be better if they did. And so when you're working with an influencer directly and you're in the office with them, you can have long discussions about these kind of things. You can see other parts of the business, you know, the bigger picture. It's not, let's just pop this video out. It's this, we're going to put this video out and it's going to lead to this, this, this. And you can look at it from more of a business angle, like how you're actually going to make money, how this is going to lead to people buying the courses or clicking on affiliate links, et cetera, uh, how this may lead to future sponsorships. That is where you get that benefit of being within a business. With an agency, it does feel slightly transactional and it's like, hey, we've got this sponsor. Because like, there's, you're just the middleman between a sponsor and an influencer mm -hmm. and you're trying to please both parties. And you know, as, as the middle guy, you're always kind of like bad guy, right? Yeah. <laughs> because you're always trying to keep both parties happy and saying, well, they don't want to concede on this particular thing within the contract. And, so it's a little bit difficult. Um, I personally really enjoy working directly with the influencer. I think it's it's much happier existence. I think that you're, you get to be more creative. You get to um, see the fruits of your labor as well. Mm -hmm. um, you know, your name is attached to it. If you're working with an influencer within an agency and that piece of content that you've helped them create goes viral or whatever, the agency gets the credit. Whereas if you're more in like a business, it's kind of like, oh yeah, Jamie helped with that kind of thing. So, you know, there's a lot of different trade-offs there. Um, I think some, I, you know, I have friends who've done both and they prefer the agency life. It's, mm -hmm. it's kind of just like who you are as a, as a person and the creators that you've worked with in the past. Yeah, I mean, I've never been on the the client side, on the inf on the side of the influencer, but I've always said that as an, as an agency person, you're hired not necessarily for your, or the, the, product that someone's buying is not necessarily your creativity. It's to make them feel more creative. And that could be through mm -hmm. something that you're creating for them or the way that you position your brand. But to your point, it's certainly not because they want some creative guru to come in and speak into uh, their own creativity, at least, at least normally um, where, you know, to your point, you're, you're sort of on the team now, right. And you're not considered an external vendor or someone who's kind of trying to change things uh from the outside you're, you're part of that engine that creative engine mm -hmm. i think that's really cool and i also love the idea of agencies are always trying to get as much more information and data as possible in order to you know paint the best picture you have all of that access to like you said you know what what is driving courses what what creative is driving revenue all that sort of thing that's pretty yeah. cool um what about just in terms of as a creative you have all these different i mean you, you were just talking about you have all these different uh, creative endeavors. You have your own YouTube, you have Instagram, like all these different things, and you are successful at them and you've built, uh, you know, solid channels. How do you balance your own uh, creativity and creative curiosity with what you're producing for the company? Mm -hmm. um, I found that I'm actually more creative. And I want to put more effort into my like side projects whilst being in this business. And I think that's largely just because you're, around Ali, you're around other YouTubers and creators and entrepreneurs that come in and out of the office, especially for like the podcast, your other people within the business, they're very creative themselves. They have their own YouTube channels, their own, um, side projects. And so it, it feels like you're within like a, a think tank almost in that mm. you kind of like, you collaborate, you help each other. You, you, you always like consulting each other, um, uh, helping them, you know, through any problems that you may have come into. And that was something that I never really had before. I, I don't really know what th what that is. I don't know if it's because it's in real life now. It feels more tangible and it feels like 
actually succeeding and getting to, you know, 100,000 subscribers, for example, that feels doable now, whereas before, it, and you're just on the internet and it's just you, the only person in your life, mm. you're kind of like, oh, I can look on the internet and see all these people have done it, but can I actually do it? Whereas when you've got other people also trying to grow their YouTube channels and you, you can speak in person, it just feels like it's, yeah, but of course, why can't we do that? Right. You know, you just got to put the work in and, and keep learning and like keep tweaking and be consistent and, you know, you eventually you'll get there. So that's something I've I've noticed since being within the business. And that's kind of like how I balance it. You know, we, Ali implemented something a number of weeks ago now where he said that the first hour of every single day, um, everyone has to spend that time working on their own projects. Wow. He's kind of said, you cannot work on the business. Uh, it's up to you to work on your own projects because I think it's very valuable that you do that. Some people do that. Um, some people will work on the business, but they'll take those hours and say, put it towards a Friday and they can then spend four hours or five hours, you know, working on their own project. But it's been useful to have that. It's, it's nice to hear, you know, the boss tell you, you know, you can work on your own projects and, yeah. and, you know, it, it feels nicer because obviously in the morning, you're more fresh, you're more awake. You can work on things. A lot of people and myself included every now and again, you finish work at, you know, 7, 8 PM. You're like, okay, I, I'm just want to go home and, you know, relax. I don't want to work on my own project. So that's been very valuable. Something else that we also did last week is that we've had a team retreat. We went to Wales, um, from Sunday till Thursday, we worked there. And the whole point of that was work on your own projects. And in that time, I got a ton of things done. Um, on all of my different projects worked on like an Instagram course that I'm going to be putting out on Skillshare, um, worked on like my usual consultancy. Um, I want to start like growing, like there's a bunch of different things and being around the team again is kind of like really what just energizes you and gives you that fuel to keep going. And so for me, that is how I kind of like balance my creativity when it comes to my projects is, is just, yeah, kind of blending those two worlds. It doesn't feel like I'm working and then I have to leave work and go and work on my own thing. It just feels like it's in flux that it's, yeah. it's all just one. Yeah, that sounds like a very unique and, and awesome, impactful place uh, to, to be. So you, when you went out as a team, you all as a team went to Wales? And then worked on individual pro You didn't work on the, the business projects. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, that's correct. Oh, uh, that's awesome. Uh, some, some people like, yeah, didn't have to do any work. They just relaxed. Some people were like, I don't even want to work on my own projects. I just want to, you know, go in the pool and go hiking and, you know, do whatever. Um, the only thing for me was to get like the daily vlog up and a uh, single main channel video. Other than that, just, yeah, worked on my own projects and, and relax. Very cool. Man, what a great uh, little uh, benefit and, and perk. I'm sure that was super enjoyable. You said that uh, part of the the appeal to it is you're in this accelerator, you're learning from everyone else. Is there something specific? And if not, that's fine too. But is there something specific that you've learned in the last several months, um, either mindset wise or even like tactically uh, that's helped you in your own creative projects? Yeah, I think it's it's the... It's just to keep taking action and to be fast with it. Hmm. Um, I'm, I'm someone who tends to overthink uh, or kind of feels like, let me just, you know, plan this whole thing out. And, you know, once I've got all of my ducks in a row, you know, then I can start the thing. Mm -hmm. what, I've, what I've learned here, especially from watching Ali, is to let just move fast and we'll break it and then we'll fix it. And that's something that he, he constantly does. He's constantly changing everything within the business um, and finding new ways to move forward. And that's something that I've started to like do with, with my own projects, um, is, is to kind of, yeah, just to move fast and, you know, when something goes wrong, then fix it as opposed to trying to, you know, walk on eggshells and make sure, okay, I've got to, you know, plan this entire thing out. And, you know, it's just sometimes like that can be very slow, especially when you're dealing with the internet, you know, the internet moves very, very quick. And so you have to match it. Yeah. Uh, back at the very beginning, you were talking about the last stop you had was with a TikTok agency. We've had a few folks on here from VaynerMedia and a few other places talk about the importance of TikTok. What what would you say had, was the main takeaway from going from longer form YouTube format uh, content to creating more for TikTok? Is there was there one big lesson or? Um, I'm just, you know, I think a lot of people have interest in TikTok. They have maybe curiosity, but it seems like this unknown thing if they haven't uh, spent a bunch of time creating on the platform yet. So any any advice for those folks? Yeah, I mean, TikTok is a completely different beast in that, <laughs> yes, it's video, but it's it's not at all like YouTube. Mm -hmm. it, it is completely different. It's, it's different in terms of who 
that audience is TikTok typically tends to skew younger. It's different, and that with that comes different like uh, attention rates, right? So TikTok's like very rapid. YouTube still you have to be kind of rapid to keep people's attention, but it's not as fast as um, TikTok. And obviously TikTok's uh, a feed, right? So like very quickly with one swipe they are gone. YouTube, yeah, you can click away, but it's it's not as easy to click away. So like there's a couple of things there when it comes to to speed and and. A lot of think a lot of people just think, well, I can take my YouTube video and I can just cut it up and repurpose it on TikTok and it's going to work like that. That's not how it works. Mm-hmm. And, you know, the, uh, a comparison that I usually draw upon is like text, right? You have these different content creation mediums. You have audio, you have uh, the written word, you have video. If you take the written word, tweets very different to an article mm-hmm. and they're very yeah. different to a book. You know, it's 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 completely different thing. Yes, it's still text, but it's a completely different way of how you would write a book compared to how you'd write an impressive tweet thread. That's the same thing here with YouTube and TikTok. With TikTok, yes, you have things like it's vertical and, and YouTube isn't typically like that, but the, the types of content that work on TikTok wouldn't necessarily work on YouTube, especially the short form content of like a, a funny foul, for example, or a, a, a 60 second you know, quote from a podcast that doesn't necessarily work so much on YouTube and mm. the algorithms work slightly differently. It'll be interesting to see how that happens. Uh, sorry, what, what happens moving forward with YouTube shorts. Um, I'm still not convinced on YouTube shorts at the moment and how they're kind of rolling that out. I think especially where you are having a lot of people creating shorts, getting a ton of subscribers and they're still releasing the long form content and not seeing those subscribers translate to views. Mm. And it's like, well, the people subscribed in the YouTube shorts algorithm, they subscribe to you for your short content. Now you're trying to sell them long form. It's, it's a different mismatch. It's like a different right? channel, it's, basically. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's completely different. And so that's why I'm interested to see how YouTube tackled that. Um, I, you know, I, I wonder if one day they'll kind of just say, you know what? We can't really tackle this TikTok problem. They've cornered that market where long form is what we do best mm-hmm. and stick to it. Because I think the, the problem YouTube may have is it could end up being like Instagram where they just keep adding features and features and features and it becomes so over bloated, no one likes it anymore. I yeah. feel like that's very much what happened with Facebook. Facebook just had everything on it. And like now no one really goes there. And I feel like Instagram will go that same way if they continue to just add. Now it's a almost a video platform in that IGTV, there's reels, there's stories. There's not too many photos anymore. And <laughs> yeah. that's fine very because rare. video is... Yeah, and it's like, that makes sense. Like, the world's moving more towards video, so they're adapting. But, like, how do you balance IGTV, real stories, and God knows what else they're going to to add in the future. And so TikTok, it's just one feed. Like, that's pretty much all they're doing at the minute. They're kind of, like, introducing the shopping aspect to it. But, I don't know, like, there's just a lot of different things that they've got to try and balance out there. So, with, with YouTube, I think they do long form well, and I think that they shouldn't, mess that up trying to chase after tiktok mm-hmm. but then again money talks and that's the reason that they've made that move and so who knows they'll i'm sure they'll figure it out yeah i heard something interesting i can't remember where i heard this i wish i could cite it but uh someone was talking about from a creator's perspective if you're creating on youtube if you're creating on really any social platform non-tiktok there are different ways in you could be an educator you could be an entertainer Um, you could be, you know, whatever, another, some other, uh, some other category. And on TikTok, you can do those different things. Like you can educate, you can provide information, you can, but you have to entertain, like it has to be Mm -hmm. entertainment first. And I thought that was a really good, um, lens on what your, what, what the difference is between the platforms. Like, yes, you can educate while you're entertaining, but if it's not entertaining, if it's not, like you said, very quick, um, and to and punchy and to the point with the creative, no one's ever going to give you a chance to educate because that's that's just the, the intent behind the platform. Do you, do you think that's accurate or? Yeah, I think that's completely accurate. I, I think, especially with things like TikTok, I think TikTok is very much a entertainment platform. Yeah, and yeah. you can obviously learn things there, but it's definitely entertainment. And YouTube has that, but it's also very much like a place you go to learn. If I ever want to learn anything. I absolutely go to YouTube. And I think a big part of that uh, as well is that YouTube is a search engine, right? Like you can go and search for specific things. Whereas with TikTok, it's all based on the algorithm. It's what you watch is what you get served. And yes, there's a search bar, but I don't think any any of us kind of think, oh, I need to know how to, 
I don't know, get a clean shave right. or how to, you know, learn how to play the guitar. I'm going to go to TikTok yeah. and find out. Like, we don't really do that, especially to learn something because what, you're going to learn it in 60 seconds? Right. <laughs> probably not. You're probably going to watch a 30 minute YouTube right. video. Right. So, like, I think there's different use cases there. And I think YouTube should, should definitely, like, keep that in mind when they're kind of, like, looking at what YouTube shorts could be and how that merges with the longer form content. Maybe they have they incentivize creators to have the long form version and the shorts version and the shorts version is almost like the trailer for the main youtube video and that's what you see when you open up the app you open up shorts and you go through and you go oh that was interesting now let me go and watch the long form that version. makes sense yeah so, something like that could 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 work as opposed to just having these completely different types of content sit separately and like i say you're kind of competing or with your own audience. Right, it's right, like, right. Yeah, if I do indeed. shorts and I do long form, who, who am I actually creating for here? Yeah. If, uh, if they're subscribing for shorts, and shorts tend to be snappier, but the long form content may be a bit more relaxed. Yeah. And so those people who subscribe for the, sh the fast paced content, they're going to eventually go, this is too boring for me. And they're going to unsubscribe. It's a bit messy. They mm -hmm. need to, to figure out what their strategy is. Well, Jamie, thank you so much for spending time with us. I know you said earlier, uh, you know, you get done at seven or eight o'clock at night and you're just like completely dead. And today you came home from that and did this with us. So we're super thankful for you uh, <laughs> uh, spending your time with us and talking with us. Before we let you go, I'd just be curious, anything, we talked a little bit about, you know, just now the tension between shorts and, and longer form YouTube. Is there, any, is there any trend that you're particularly excited about when it comes to content, new media, anything like that? Or, or a project you have going on? Yeah, I think with YouTube at the moment, like it, maybe it's just me, but YouTube the last like year and a half, two years has been kind of boring. That mm -hmm. doesn't really feel like there's been many major breakout YouTubers who've like shaken the YouTuber mold and said, this is what it means to be a YouTuber. You know, you think of 2016, you know, you had like Casey Nice that come along with right. the daily vlogging. That was a type of vlogging no one had ever seen. That obviously then moved on to Logan and Jake Paul with their faster pace editing. And that moved on to like the Mr. Beast type of content. That's, you know, like huge budgets. So over the top, we haven't really had anything. I feel like that's kind mm. of like made us go, oh, this is interesting. This is different. Um, like I say, maybe I'm wrong, but that, that, that's just me. And something that I think is interesting is, is Ryan Trahan. He's, he's kind of makes very similar videos to Mr. Beast. Um, but he started uh, a series a couple of years back called uh, Surviving with a uh, a, a cent a day or something like that and he starts to create a bunch of these videos and earlier this year he got he blew up with a youtube called surviving in the world's loudest room hmm. and then he released another video called surviving in the world's quietest room and he just started to build from there and something that he's currently doing is on day 14 at the minute is that he's releasing a daily video by the way he used to release a video every two weeks now he's releasing them every single day and they are almost like a vlog, but they're in like a Mr. Beast format. Oh, wow. In that he's going from LA to the East Coast. I don't know where in the East Coast, but he's going from LA to the East Coast, surviving on only a cent a day. And he's trying to get across there. Like he, and like the content's really creative. He's going up <laughs> wow. to people like, I'll sell you this water bottle for a dollar. He'll get the dollar. I'll then go and buy an ice cold bottle of water. I'll sell you this for $2. Now he's got $2. And he's doing that and getting across America and he's doing it now and people can actually go and see him right now i think he's in texas so you can go watch him you can help him on his journey and like that's a really interesting way of like merging two different genres yeah. between like daily vlogging and like this mr beast style and the first episode i think had like 15 million views currently he's holding six million views on average per day wow like, that's insane that's crazy six million a day that's bigger than tv shows you know network shows and so that's a really interesting trend. I've never seen anyone do that before. And so I'm excited to see like what he does when he reaches the 30 days and how that's going to shape his channel. So he starts to do this more often because his subscriber count is blowing up. His views are blowing up. His ad sense will be blowing up. So yeah. I think it's a good move for him. Yeah. He'll have more than a cent a day for sure. Uh, when... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah definitely. This, this is done. That's Ryan Trahan. We'll have to link that uh, in the show notes below so people can check it out. And then you mentioned at the beginning, you have a new tube, new YouTube channel coming out is that live is that something we can um we can send people to yes i, I can send you the link after this it's for uh, a youtube channel um, that i've kind of like experimenting on for, for a little while like one of the a pieces of advice that ali gives in ptya is when you're starting off on youtube you're either an architect or an archaeologist hmm. and if you're an architect you kind of know what it is that you want to do you might say well 
I like going fishing. I'm going to create a fishing YouTube channel. You can plan out how you're going to do that because you're very specific. If you have no idea and you just have a variety of interests, then you're more of an archaeologist. You're just going around and you're hmm, discovering what is the thing that you're you're good at, what your audience like watching. And I feel like I've been like in in that sort of place for a number of years now. If you go to my YouTube channel, it's digital marketing, it's vlogs, it's YouTube tips, it's it's kind of like everything. And um in the past sort of like two weeks, I thought, you know, it'd be quite nice to like start doing like some YouTube consultancy. And so I think the the route that I'm going to go is to start producing videos on YouTube, kind of breaking down how YouTubers are growing, how they're like growing their own businesses and their teams and kind of all of that sort of stuff. And so I'm also going to be converting my Instagram account into 10 carousels every single day, um, breaking down like a YouTube tip. I've started awesome. doing two of those already. And so that's kind of like what I've got going on at the minute. Um, but yeah, T 10 a day you're going to do on Instagram. 10, 10, so 10, ten uh, one carousel, but there'll be 10 images within ten, that carousel. Yeah, that's powerful. Um, yeah, that's yeah. I mean, this is kind of like how I grew. So I have a, another Instagram account called Yeezy Thoughts. Um, I'm a huge Kanye West fan. OK. And something that I noticed uh, at the beginning of lockdown in 2020 when I had all this extra, uh, time on my hands was that there were a lot of quote pages on Instagram that were doing very well. and they had like a million mm. followers getting tons of likes and they were just putting up a daily quote. And I was like, oh, I could, you know, create a, a Instagram account like this. Like the graphics weren't that interesting. I thought I can do a better job here. And then maybe I can sell posters or something with these quotes on and like I can make this maybe a business. And I started to do that and it was difficult because it's just such a saturated place. And Instagram is not, a, it's very much an echo chamber mm. unless you're lucky to get on the explore page. And so... I thought, well, okay, let me combine this with like a, a niche. And I had followed many Kanye West Instagram accounts. Like I said, I was a big fan. Yep. So I thought, well, Kanye has said loads of quotable things in the past. Um, why don't <laughs> yeah. I just like merge that together? <laughs> and so I started this page and I, every single day, I, I had about like three, 400 quotes from Kanye oh, in a wow. Notion database. And I just started to make these carousel images. And the reason I made it a carousel image as opposed to just the quote, which is what a lot of these quote pages were doing, was because uh, it counts as engagement every time mm. they have to swipe to see that. So the, the image that you would see on the feed would be a photo of Kanye West. And then I had each of the individual carousels designed like one of his album covers. So cool. And so and the, there would be text on there saying Kanye's thoughts on whatever. And then you'd have to swipe to see what his thoughts were. And you, then you'd have the quote. And so that was incentivizing people to share it. What I didn't realize was that people love sharing quotes. Mm. And so people would be sharing this to their stories all the time. And some of these uh, posts would be getting like 200K impressions a day. It was insane. And the YouTube channel blew up. Uh, I'm sorry, the Instagram account blew up um, when I had just started it and within 90 days, it'd grown to 15,000 followers. Wow. Um, it just continued to keep growing. And since then I've kind of like spinned it off into having like your own posters. I got into like a drop shipping business where I was sending like, um, there's like caps out there that were all related and would be of interest to, uh, like hip hop and Kanye West fans. Mm. And so that's kind of like what I want to do with this, well, with my personal Instagram now and that I'm going to try and build up with these carousels. Um, that have like a YouTube tip or something like that. Maybe it, I'm not sure if it's going to be just around YouTube. I think it might be around creator economy. Like that kind of interests me. And so that's kind of the route that I'm thinking I'm going to go in. Incredible. That sounds, uh, first of all, incredible story about the Kanye quotes. Is that still up? Is that, is that page still up? Yeah, still up. I'm, I'm currently in the process of trying to find someone to help kind of like on that. Cause it is a lot of work to, to sure. do like daily carousels. And so, yeah. And you said it was called uh, it's Kanye called. or Yeezy thoughts. Is that what it was? Easy thoughts. Easy thoughts. Yes. Okay, we'll have to link that. And uh, and yeah, sounds like a great idea. I mean, obviously, our show is is exists to have those conversations and uh, putting that on Instagram and finding ways to extend that to to people who, because um, I mean, that's where a lot of people spend time is is a no brainer. So that uh, yeah, we'll definitely um, we'll definitely check it out and support it. Jamie, we're so thankful to you for spending your time with us. If people want to catch up with you outside of Easy Thoughts, uh, where where can they look at all the stuff that you're doing? Um, yeah, you can follow me on Instagram, which will be Jamie Whiffin, uh, Whiffin White T, YT for YouTube, uh, over on Twitter. Um, and I'm sure you'll link my, my YouTube channel down below. We will. We will. Thank you again so much. We'd love to have you on and we'll have to catch up again soon. Amazing. Thanks, Adam.